you have a Bible, let's uh, turn to Acts chapter 8. Uh, I'm a little embarrassed today because uh, I'm bringing to you a message that is very similar to messages you've heard again and again through the book of Acts. Uh, it's a sermon on the topic, strangely enough, of evangelism. And if you're a little uncomfortable with hearing sermons on the topic of evangelism, then the book of Acts is going to be rough. I have to tell you. Uh, it's, very t it's, a very, uh, it's a very full of evangelism. In fact, as I try to preach expositorily, I won't walk my way through a passage uh, or a book of the Bible. Uh, but one of the things that that does is brings up the topic that's there rather than ones that I would necessarily just sort of pick out of the air. It's the story today of, of Christians taking the command to spread the good news of, of Jesus Christ seriously. So as we read through the history of the development of the early church in the book of Acts, uh, we, we can't help but draw the application that what God gave and what Christ, even as he was on the earth with his disciples, gave them to do, they were not able to finish. And in fact, we're still doing it. We're as a church here in Frankston, seeking to do what he told his disciples to be about. And we can do it with as much enthusiasm and faith and boldness, and dare I say it, even expectation that the disciples did when they listened to their Lord tell them to go into the world and preach the gospel and make disciples of all the nations. So with the help of the Holy Spirit, we have expectation and we have boldness, I think, that we can look forward to. So the answer to this question that I'm about to ask may not be yes for you. At least because God doesn't work identically with all of us. But I do want to ask the question anyway, and I want you to think about it. My question is, did God provide you with opportunities this week to share the gospel? To share your faith? To share uh, the things that you hold true in, in your relationship with Jesus Christ with someone else? So take a minute and think about that seriously. Again, God doesn't work with all of us the same, and so I can't say that, yes, he did. But uh, I want you to think about the fact that were you asking the question, were you conscious of an intentionality in your life to be able to do so this week? Because God doesn't command us to do something and then providentially keep us from an ability to do it. He's given us a command to be about that work, and then we can't sort of blame him and say, God, well, you just didn't provide any opportunities. Uh, so likely what we're dealing with, all of us, and, and, and I have to say, sometimes evangelism is not a topic I, I feel very comfortable with because of my own lack of failures in it, but uh, what I'm probably wrestling with, and you may be wrestling with as well, is likely a growing awareness of those opportunities. And then also a preparedness to act when the opportunities are before you. So today we're following on with Philip, who uh, among the, the many faithful people uh, early in the, in the first century as these disciples followed Christ, uh, was sharing the gospel. Uh, he's called the evangelist, and we said that he's actually the only one in the New Testament who's given that title. But in many ways, uh, he stands as an example for us, a model for a life of evangelism. We saw last time that he was one who was willing to take the gospel to an area that probably most people as Jews didn't want to go to, to Samaria. And we find him in Samaria breaking ground in a new way uh, in the gospel, seeing the Holy Spirit blessed in tremendous ways. People were coming to faith in large groups. Tremendously successful ministry. Peter and John had to come up from Jerusalem just so that they could witness and confer and make sure that this was uh, was really, was this the right thing? And yet they see multitudes of people in that city are coming to faith, they're rejoicing because Philip had shared the gospel with them. What, what can we learn uh, from Philip? How can this message affect our lives in our situation? I think the answer comes as we learn what the life of somebody who is readily sharing the gospel with other people, what's that like? Again, not all of us will have the special gifts of evangelism that Philip had, and we shouldn't expect that that would be the case. We may not all have the same kinds of, uh, the timing of the Holy Spirit may be different for us. But nevertheless, every one of us is called in the scripture to be ready to give an answer to those who are uh, 
uh, wondering or asking us about our faith in the gospel, our hope, the hope that we have. So today I want us to learn not just what Philip's life was like as an evangelist, but what our lives can be like and should be like as evangelists, so that I, I want us to pay careful attention and see what we can figure out. Now let's turn here to Acts chapter 8, he's probably got that up here already, in verse 25 through 40. So let's read God's word, uh, hearing what, what God does with Philip here. We read this, Now when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, this is Peter and John, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship. And was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shear is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or someone else? And then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with the scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is some water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. And the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus. And as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. One of the fun things to do when you're reading a text like this in Acts or any of the stories that you see in Scripture is to try to put yourself on the scene. So I want you to put yourself, try, try to put yourself in the shoes of Philip. Uh, you'll remember that the great persecution is going on in the city of Jerusalem and that Philip had to flee uh, along with the, so many other of the, of the people in Jerusalem. He had to flee his own home. So as he's fleeing, he desires to be used of God continually to spread the good news, and so he heads north into Samaria, even though that was a difficult thing for anyone to do, I think. And while he's there, he's somewhat surprised to see the result of his sharing good news, and that is that many people are coming to faith. In fact, multitudes are coming to faith. God's clearly doing something remarkable in this town of Samaria. Think about what he's doing each day. I don't know what he did for a home, because he's still probably homeless in some ways, but each day he's, he's finding a way to minister to these people who are coming to Christ. What a great ministry. What an exciting And then suddenly, an angel of the Lord says to Philip, Arise and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. I want you to go out into the wilderness. And you probably are having a little trouble, as I would, putting myself in Philip's shoes. I mean, what, what, how do we know, right? Maybe it'd be easier to imagine the scenario if we, if we made the story something that happened here in Frankston. And you are actively engaged in the ministry here in Frankston, and God is blessing it like crazy. For some reason, people are starting to come and hear the gospel. They're coming to faith, and we're starting to fill the room here. In fact, we're having to look for a new building very quickly because this isn't going to cut it. We're having two or three services and it's not working. Uh, we're overgrowing the space. And then a friend of yours, and you're very actively involved in sharing this, and you're one of the only ones in the city of Frankston who's able to minister to so many people, and yet suddenly you get a phone call from one of your friends, and your friend was an old high school buddy, 
who lives up in uh, Alice Springs, and he says to you something like, I found out I have terminal cancer, and I remember back in high school that you were a Christian. Would you be willing to come up to Alice Springs and help me understand this thing that you believe about, about God? I need to think about that because I'm about to meet God, and I want to know what to think about that. So maybe that's an easier scenario to think about. You're, you're wrestling with the fact that God has, is blessing the work here, and there's so many people that are, 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 are really coming to faith. What do I do with that? I think this must have gone through Philip's mind. God, what, what would you have me leave that and go to the desert for? Why would you have me pick up this exciting ministry of scores of people and then during a crucial time in the ministry's development, leave it? and go down to this place out in the middle of nowhere. Well, I, I kind of want to know the answer to that. Why would God do that? Why would he take the story that we have here in Acts 8, why would he take this key guy and put him down in a region to meet one person? And why would Philip go? <laughs> why would Philip leave that thriving ministry and go to one person? Perhaps it's, it's easy to see what God was doing after the fact. Right? With history laid out before us, we can go back and see and see God starting with the Jewish people and then taking it to Samaria, and now he's taking it to a Gentile who's pure, a pure Gentile from Ethiopia, a far distant country, and the, and the gospel's going out, and we can see God doing that. But from the perspective of Philip, if I'm putting myself in his shoes, he has no idea what God's doing with him. And I, I don't know if you feel that way often, but I feel that way all the time. I don't know tomorrow what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know what's going to be blessed of God, what's not going to be blessed of God. I can think about, let's try this, or let's do that, or let's work with these people. Typically, I would think that I would want to work with the people that are seemingly responding very quickly to God's ministry and so on. And I haven't had an angel from heaven come to say, go do something differently, but that's what Philip had the benefit of at least. But I want you to think about this, and that is that God's reasoning for his providential governing of events in your life never seems all that clear to us in the present, does it? We don't have a clear explanation of what God's doing. We know of God that his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. I think what one of the things we learned from the, from the text of Scripture is that God's thoughts are supra- natural, supra-rational even. Uh, he's not irrational. God's thoughts are not irrational. They are supra-rational. In other words, they are above reason, above even our ability to understand them. That means we, we have to learn to submit to God's, uh, his callings and so on, as Philip did, to God's omniscient plan, his providence and so on. And to do so particularly with regard to this issue of being ready to share the gospel when the opportunity comes. So when we're talking about evangelism, we're not talking necessarily about somebody getting a soapbox, going downtown, putting the soapbox in a public arena, and standing on that box and preaching. Right? We're not talking even about somebody uh, finding a pulpit and preaching at a revival meeting or something of that nature. We're not talking about being hired as a special speaker at a conference. What we're talking about here is people who have an opportunity because they've lived their whole life in a readiness and a willingness to be looking intentionally to share their life of Christ, what, what they've learned about Christ with other people. We're speaking about a whole life that li is lived in an evangelistic mode, if I could say it that way. A sharing mode. A life, I think you've heard me say it before, of intention. So as we look at Philip's willingness to go where God was leading him, I want us to see a couple of principles, actually several principles here today from, from Philip's life that I think would be really wonderful if each of us had these in our own lives as well. Uh, quite naturally, intentionally uh, ready to share the gospel. And the first of those principles is that God has already prepared divine appointments for you in unexpected places. God has prepared divine appointments for you in unexpected places. And I want you to, to realize, maybe this isn't something you're visualizing, but I want you, to, if you, if you can, to have a map in your head of Samaria to the north,
Jerusalem to the south, although it's in higher in the mountains. But then from there, going down the mountains to the south, even farther south, to Gaza, out in the wilderness. Samaria, Jerusalem, Gaza. That's the, that's the picture I want you to have in your mind. So when Philip is first told to get up and go to that road between Jerusalem and Gaza, he's leaving from the north, going south, up the mountains to Jerusalem, and then back down the mountains south to this region out in the middle of nowhere. But God calls somebody like this and reminds me of Abraham, saying, I want you to leave your house, your homeland and everything, and go to the land that I'll show you. All he said is go down to this road that's leaving from Jerusalem to Gaza. Just go out on that road somewhere. And so he gets up and he has to walk. And he starts walking. And at the same time, God is working some other things. God is taking an Ethiopian who has made a trip from Ethiopia deep in the south, way beyond Gaza, down southwest of there, around the Mediterranean. And that person has had a desire to worship God as a as a uh, God-fearer, doesn't understand all the gospel by any stretch of the imagination, but he's come to understand that there's a God, and he wants to worship that living and true God that he's heard about that is in Jerusalem. So he makes a trip to Jerusalem, and he's been there, and while he's there, he purchases, probably with the queen's money, I don't know for sure, but he, he purchases a document, which is a record of the scriptures from the book of Isaiah. Philip is walking south, and a man is now making his way home to Ethiopia. So what's happening is that Philip is walking along a road and suddenly a chariot comes up behind him. And somehow maybe it parks somewhere where he's going to encounter this chariot. We don't know exactly how it happens. But the point is, they encounter each other because God has, uh, he has prepared a divine appointment for, for him. All right? Philip had to at least leave his place not knowing where he's going. He's going... To who knows what? Actually, that's not the right way to say it because we know that God knows what. So he's leaving, but he can't see God's providence. He doesn't know what's coming, but he says, God, I'll, I'll, I'll go and follow what you want me to do. And then an opportunity provides itself. The Lord brings this appointment to bear on his life. It sneaks up beside him, as it were. It surprises him in some ways. And that's often the way we meet with God's divine appointments. We can't predict that they're coming. We don't know. We can't look ahead and plan for their arrival. In fact, we're often uh, looking ahead, trying to make plans, aren't we? When I get to Gaza, I'm going to go into the public market and I'm going to start set up a, a little stand and I'm going to share the gospel. Maybe that's what his plans were. But you see, the Lord brings up an opportunity that he's not ready for. Go up and join the chariot, he said. That's God speaking to Philip to do this. So in obedience... We're to be obeying God's general directions, being ready to share, and we will encounter, as it were, his divine appointments. Now, I doubt Philip would have chosen to leave a great, exciting ministry in Samaria to speak to one person. But it wasn't until he does, in obedience, he meets this person that he begins to see the significance of what's happening. Because this isn't just any person he's meeting. This is a person who is got influence in the world. <clears throat> in God's eyes, it's not less significant uh, for us to speak to one individual, maybe after on our lunch break at work, than it is for, say, Billy Graham to speak to a whole crowd of people when he was doing this. He's, this is the, a man that he's doing his, uh, who, who God brings to him. He turns out to be the keeper of the treasury for the whole nation of, of Ethiopia which back in the first century is a great deal larger than it is today. We're talking about a region that covers much of the northern, northeastern side of, of Africa. And he is the right-hand man to the queen, which means that he has, a, he has more influence than anybody else in the country except for the queen herself. Even more than the king has, probably. So here he is, and God brings this individual, a significant individual, to him that's going to have some influence. Now, so, the first thing is God's got these appointments. Secondly, those opportunities are sometimes fleeting. Second point is that they're often fleeting. God said, go, and Philip did what? Well, let me think about this. I've got such a good ministry in Samaria going on here. I know you're an angel, but <laughs> I'm not sure that's the best.
plan strategically to, to, to do what ministry should happen here. No, he doesn't. He hears from God, he arises, and he goes. Is it not possible that if he had paused and thought about that very much, that the chariot would have already gone past him? But it's a fleeting opportunity, and he takes it, and God uses that in a strategic way, providentially, so that he meets the, the opportunity where it needs to happen. If we don't act when we have opportunity, often those opportunities are fleeting. Now, as Philip's going along and he sees this chariot, he overhears the man reading the text of Isaiah. He's reading in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And why is he hearing it out loud? You ever thought about that? Why is the Ethiopian reading out loud? Well, part of that is when you buy a manuscript, all of the letters are put together in just one string of letters. You don't know where one word ends and one word begins unless, as you're reading it, you're sort of hearing it in your own language, and it makes sense to stop that word there and go on to the next word. And so that's likely why he was reading it the way he was, and, and Philip's able to hear that. Philip doesn't assume that the man is a believer. Right? He takes an opportunity to share the Christ, and this uh, would not have happened if Philip was not watchful and uh, be about the work that God was calling to. Third, this principle to learn from this passage about Philip, I think, is this, that God has prepared the way for these divine appointments. God prepares the way when he is giving you a divine appointment. Some of you, I think, could testify to this in your own personal life story. When you came to faith, had God prepared you for hearing the message of the gospel in any way? Uh, God had been working, perhaps, in your heart in preparation for the time when someone clearly shares the gospel with you? Well, the same is true for those God has ordained unto life that he is bringing to you that you'll share the gospel with. So, so you ask, how, how had God prepared the way for this Ethiopian? Well, I have to ask the question, why is an Ethiopian reading Isaiah in the first place? Why is a Gentile reading Isaiah? Had God provided a previous opportunity for the Ethiopians to meet Jehovah? And that's why we read, at least in part, one of the reasons we read the portion we did from 2 Chronicles chapter 9, where the Queen of Sheba from Ethiopia, in that region of the world at least, had been up with Jerusalem. We know she heard from Solomon about his wisdom. What's the, what's the beginning of wisdom? What's, what's the beginning of wisdom? You know the answer to that, right? The beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. And Isaiah uh, has, has got that in there, but of course... I'm sure Solomon was sharing that. It's very likely that during that exchange, Solomon shared the source of his wisdom and then passed on a text of the scriptures to her. And she and her countrymen would have it. Now, you'll notice from 2 Chronicles 9 that she has quite a bit of knowledge. She's done a little bit of homework before she gets to Jerusalem. She knows the name of this God. She knows the name is Jehovah. She says that. Blessed be Jehovah, your God, because your God loved Israel. That's unique information, right? And would establish Israel forever. He has made you, Solomon, king over his people. That's quite a bit of theological knowledge, I think, for this queen to have in him. So it's pretty good insights. So as Philip approaches the chariot, has this man had any background? I think he discovers that God's word is already in the mind of this this unit. Had he been prepared by God? Well, Philip finds him reading a text of scripture. I don't know if you found somebody in the streets of Frankston who was an unbeliever, who didn't know much about God, and yet was reading Isaiah chapter 53. Would you not be pretty excited about that? I would, because that's a unique passage of scripture in Isaiah. That's one that points to Christ clearer than many, although they, many of them do. It's, it's reasonable to assume, at least, that the man, if he's reading chapter 53, had probably read chapter 52, probably read chapter 51, probably read a good bit of this text already. What does that tell you? Well, he learned things like God is a holy God. Chapter 6 of Isaiah, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And what happens to Isaiah the prophet when he sees that God? He falls on his face and God lifts him up. And then in chapter, you know, you can go on through the text and I can show you all sorts of things, but when you get to chapter 59, you learn that that sin has made a separation between you and this God. And you can't, you can't be right with this God because of your sin. 
He won't even listen to your prayers because of your sin. And yet, we learn more as we go further into that, uh, that this holy God has made a way for the sinner to come to him and be reunited. That sin separates us from God, yes, but he has made a way through this one, this one who is the Lamb of God. And so he reads this portion of the text, and that's what he's reading when Philip hears it. Jesus, he shares with him, is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He suffered in the place of sinners to bring us back to God. What a remarkable thing to be able to, to take that passage of Scripture and show him the gospel. So God prepares the way for these divine appointments often, and this leads to the next point, and that is often an interpreter is needed. Often an interpreter is needed. The man was reading the gospel account that's in the Old Testament. And yet simply he didn't understand it. His comment to Philip is, is telling, isn't it? How can I unless I have someone to explain it to? Me? While I was living in uh, Bloomington, Indiana, this was the first, when I first came out of seminary, we moved to Bloomington, Indiana. It's a university town that has 30,000 students in it. During the breaks, the town would empty. <laughs> the streets would be empty, but when the students came back, you couldn't even walk in the street. You couldn't drive anywhere. It was hard to get around because of the cars. But one of the things I did early on uh, with uh, the other pastor, he and I came up with the idea of giving away free Bibles to students. So I would go over on campus, and I would say, if you want a free Bible, I've got a stack of them here. You, you're welcome to have one. Uh, another thing that Bill did with the other pastor, he, he put an ad in the newspaper saying, if you want a Bible, Call us and we'll bring you a Bible. And when he did that, 33 people took us up on it. Striking. But I can tell you that a lot of people have Bibles. A lot of people probably even in Australia remarkably have Bibles. Not maybe all, but many do. And some of them even read it. But often they need someone to explain it to them clearly. I think of the testimony of one of the good friends that we made in Indiana when I was there. His name is Sean Marston. God had done a lot of work. And I said he prepares the way sometimes. He had done a lot of work in Sean's life. Now, Sean was doing something that I think he wouldn't have thought quite two things about. I kind of think the, the girl should have known better, but she was dating an unbeliever. She was a believer. He was an unbeliever. Uh, her parents were pretty concerned about that. So they were feeding Sean... All kinds of books to read. Lots of Reformed literature, lots of things, encouraging him, as well as him reading the Bible. So he had been reading the Bible. He had even been reading Reformed theology uh, in these books. But it wasn't until Sean sat in a Bible study and heard the Gospel clearly explained, and then after that Bible study, during the week that followed that Bible study, one of the guys in the Bible study took Sean apart separately and said, Sean, do you understand what you're reading and what, what these things are about? Did you understand that gospel that you heard the other day? It wasn't until then that Sean came to faith in Jesus Christ. God prepared the way, but sometimes an interpreter is needed. And that interpreter can be you. So it is with most conversions. God does the preliminary work of softening the heart and then uses us as instruments to interpret that message of the scriptures to those who could not understand it apart from having someone to guide them. And he doesn't always do that. There are occasions when the Holy Spirit just purely opens the word for them in their understanding. But if we wish to imitate the life of this evangelist, Philip, we need to be willing to involve ourselves in the lives of other people in sometimes what seems a bit of an invasive kind of way. Sometimes the butting in, it almost seems like we're butting into their life where we should just give them a little space. Maybe you think, Philip could have uh, said, or somebody could have said to Philip, what are you doing with that guy? Leave him alone. You have no right to interrupt this man who's reading. You don't know him from Adam. Mind your business. Mind your own business. But you see, that is the Christian's business. It is the Christian's business. God has called you to butt in. And you ought not to feel any more awkward about that than a doctor would. If a doctor overhears two people talking about a certain medicine that they're going to take and they misunderstand the application of that medicine in a person's life, it could harm them. And the doctor says, let me butt in here for a moment and just say something to you that you need to know. I don't think we ought to feel any more uh, awkward about butting in to someone who's, who's 
perhaps understanding things in such a way that leads them on a path to hell when we have life to give. Well, we can learn from Philip's manner as well. Philip doesn't just butt in in a such a way as to be annoying. <laughs> Philip involved himself, but he does so in a very non-threatening way. He asks an assessment question to find out if the man is willing to have him come. Is he willing to have me come and talk to him about these things? Do you understand what you're reading? The man could have said, I, I'm not interested in any help, thank you, I'll be fine. But he doesn't do that. He made himself available for spiritual help and advice. I think that's what we can do without any threatening to anybody at all. We can say, you know, if you ever have a question, I'm glad to interact with you about these things. And in fact, I would, I would really enjoy doing that with you if you're willing to let me do that. And that's a great approach. As those who've been given spiritual eyes to see, we have a great deal to offer. Sometimes we're fearful that we don't have that much to offer. And that's simply not true. You have the knowledge of life in Christ. And that's so important for people. All right? He made himself available. We're, we're the ones who have the water for thirsty people. They may not even realize that they're thirsty, but we have that water. Uh, the next three principles I can give you very simply. The fifth is this. That it, your interaction has to contain the heart of the message of the gospel, not the peripherals. Not just the peripherals to it. Philip didn't allow himself to get caught up in any particular issues that this man might have brought up. He sticks to the gospel and he preaches Christ. Dr. James Boyce asks an important question. Uh, it's very convicting to me. But he asks the question, can you do that? Can you start with any given passage of scripture and from that passage share the gospel from it? I have to say, now that's a whole lot easier with Isaiah 53 than it is from Numbers chapter 6 or whatever. Numbers chapter 8, Numbers anything. <laughs> okay, Isaiah 53 is easier. But the, the reality is that the whole scriptures point to Christ, don't they? Ultimately, this passage in Numbers is moving its way to Christ. God was dealing with his people, his people in numbers, to work a certain way. That's true of all the passages of scripture, is that God's pointing us ultimately to Christ. Next, at some point in our instruction, I think it would be good for us to try to include the role or the place of the church in God's saving plan. I don't think it has to be forced in every conversation for sure, but if the person is open to the gospel, it's good for them ultimately to understand the place of the church. Because true faith must be outwardly and publicly professed, not privately held in a box somewhere. Philip didn't leave the Ethiopian content that he had come to faith and that's all that mattered, you go back home. No, rather he speaks of the need, I'm quite convinced that we, though we don't have it recorded in the text, he must have talked about the need to be included in the visible church through the sign of the covenant, the sign of baptism. Because that's why the Ethiopian then says to him, he might have had some knowledge of this when he was in Jerusalem, or whatever, I'm not sure. But he at least says, what's keeping me from being able to be baptized, to be included in that number? So true believers, that's something they're glad they want to do. A very important man is in this chariot. And he does something which may have seemed undignified in some cultures. He's willing to go down into the water with this other man that we hardly even know. Uh, and he does that right in front of his servants. The wonderful truth he had discovered of redemption from sin in the person of Jesus Christ overcomes any sense of, of this pride or arrogance concerning his position. And he, he may be the most, second most important person in Ethiopia, but he recognizes he's a bondservant of Jesus Christ, and he wants to be obedient to that. And then finally, I want us to note something about Philip's life and evangelism following this incident. Uh, this is a hard one. I, mean, I don't want to say hard, it's actually very important the way you understand. Verse 40 says an interesting thing about Philip. It says, Philip found himself at Azotus. We don't, don't understand what miraculous thing has happened here, but Philip is snatched away in the spirit and plopped down in Azotus. So what does Philip do? He's always doing this, because it's his, his intention is always to share the gospel, so he does. And then it says, he kept preaching the gospel to all the cities until he came to Caesarea. I'm going to say, what happens in Caesarea? What's going on in Caesarea? 
The only other reference in the Bible to the person of Philip is found uh, in chapter 21 of Acts, verses 8 and 9. And Philip is still in Caesarea in chapter 21, verses 8 and 9. Talk about 20 years later, Philip is, is in the city living in Caesarea now. He's settled down. We know that he got married at some point, and he has four children, four daughters. And Luke records just one little blurb about his life, and that is that when Paul and Barnabas and some others were traveling through, they stopped in Caesarea, and they stayed at his house. They stayed in Philip's house, and he received them warmly with hospitality. Now, the point of, I'm, I want to make here is this, that there are different stages in the life of someone wanting to share the gospel. Different stages in the life of an evangelist. And we ought not to expect that all of our life will be as exciting and thrilling in, in evangelistic ways as all the rest of life. For example, uh, it's not going to be the same as flashy as Philip being in Samaria, where he's got a thriving ministry going on there. It's not always going to be that he meets someone from the second most important person in Ethiopia and he can share the gospel with that person, you see. This doesn't mean that evangelism nor usefulness in the kingdom has to come to an end at any point as you shift one stage of life into another stage of life. But when Philip got married, when he had children, that changes things in life, doesn't it? He can't be out on the streets all the time sharing the gospel. He can't be away from home all the time. He's got family responsibilities. Time, instead, he, he pursues, under those new life circumstances, new avenues of being an evangelist. How can I keep doing what God's called me to, but under these new circumstances? And it has to change. He opens his house now for hospitality in a way that he probably hadn't done before. That's a key role of evangelism that we can use. And most notably, and I think maybe we play this down sometimes, but what is he doing? But he's taught his children. He's evangelized his children. He has trained them in the ways of God. And that is a key thing in the life of a believer who wants to share the gospel. We're told that later on, Philip's daughters prophesied. Now, this is a New, New Testament age period of time, so it's maybe a little unique because... Prophecy is, a, is one of those things that ceases at a certain point, but God, what that means is that they are hearing from God and they're sharing with other people what they hear from God. That's, that's evangelism. That's proclaiming the word of God in truth. So that's something that he did. Philip invested in his own children and now they're doing as well. So I need to wrap this up, but I want us to catch those main ideas, not just so that we can be periodic in our in evangelism by having special evangelistic services. I want us to learn together how to be always ready, looking for those divine appointments that God brings. In whatever stage of life you are, in whatever circumstances, maybe you don't have the same kind of energy that you did earlier in life for this kind of thing, but in whatever stage, living a life of evangelism and doing so intentionally. Trust God. For those appointments to come, perhaps they'll surprise you. Secondly, act when the iron is hot. Don't hem and haw about it. Don't miss the opportunity. When Look for those in whom God has prepared them in some way. If you see someone that God is working in their lives, be looking for that opportunity. Acknowledge that people need you. They need an interpreter. They need someone to make themselves available to them to help them in, in areas where they don't understand. In your interactions, don't leave them without the gospel heart. In other words, don't get caught up in this, the extra questions. Well, you worship in Samaria, we worship in Jerusalem. Or, you know, you guys, don't you baptize infants? Or, you know, don't get caught up in the extras when you're talking with unbelievers. Focus on Christ. Make sure they understand Christ. And as you're able, I think it's important eventually to get to the point of explaining the role of the church in their life. Because that's the body that God has intended for them. And then recognize that your life does change. <laughs> there are different stages in your life. And your, our goal is to be looking for those the different ways that we can express the gospel in each of those unique circumstances. Okay?
Well, let's pray and ask God's help in all that. Father in heaven, um, we are thankful for the fact that we have examples in the scripture like Philip, like Stephen, like Peter, like John, like uh, so many others in the scripture that you have given us. Father, we pray that you will help us in our application of these things. Help us get the principles and be living them out ourselves in our own life circumstances. Lord, we, we need your spirit's work in our hearts to first of all um, help us grasp the beauty of the gospel, but then secondly to have a boldness to uh, buddy it in some ways in other people's lives and provide that help to be that interpreter. So enable us, Lord, to, to follow your ways here. Help us to encourage one another in it. Um, I feel like we're all being convicted here of things, and I pray that you'll simply encourage us in it. And as we see um, encounters, that we'll, we'll thank you for those and uh, be excited to hear what happens. pray you'll continue to bless us in that and bring us uh, those who will, by your grace and your mercy, come to faith. We ask in Jesus' name.